Start out in Luke 22. Luke 22. I just want to mention to you guys, if you see seats in the front and you want to get a little closer, we're not against you moving closer to the front. I got a couple of seats up here and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt if you wanted to. We call that preacher friendly. It happens a lot out at the other campus. I know I don't invite y'all as much. Had a woman almost die last Sunday in church while I was preaching. I, I get all kind of responses, as you know. And uh, I, I love this lady, I do. And uh, she, just, she just literally, and, and, but it's happened before. And when it happens, uh, because it's happened before, I didn't panic. And our nurses began to take care of her and look after her. And her heart rate went down. And, uh, you know, the ambulance came. But I had to have to keep people focused. And somebody says, after church, they said, you really did a good job keeping people focused during the service when everybody was kind of checked. Because, you know, it's, it's a toss-up, isn't it? If you die, if you died in church, is that such a bad thing? I often think of myself. If I died back here, you know, it, yeah, it, 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 would, it would what? It would shift the atmosphere. Yeah, it would. It would. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? It may cause revival. You know, I don't know. But either way, I, I just I think about that, you know, because I've been preaching now for over 30 years and it has happened. So when it does, my response to how I handle that is, is how Pastor Joseph and Josh and others that are going to preach and pastor in life. We're going to have to learn how to handle things, you know, and that's important that you stay focused. Now, if I knew she was in danger, you know, I, I would have shut things down. They would have been a little bit different. I'd, I'd had to do it. But uh, I've been there before. She got a pacemaker this week. Heart's kicking up. It's going to be fine. Amen. But one thing I know is that we're all going to exit this world. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute as I move through Scripture. Luke chapter 22. Can I ask you, are you, are you comfortable? I just want, I need to ask y'all that every now and then because I can tell you're starting to get a little comfortable. You know, I was stuck in, I wasn't stuck. I got in a, a big snowstorm out in Colorado with my grandkids and son. And Leon sent me a picture of his son who was up in Woodland Park, which, which was north of us. And his 03 Mustang was covered to the top with snow. He stuck. He couldn't get out. And uh, so that's why that moment of you need to go hit me. <clears throat> and my grandkids were going, let's stay, let's pray. They have no idea the danger when they're grandkids, do they? They don't have any idea. But when you're Papa, you better step up, get out of there, you know. So we did. Last week we talked about Simon Peter, who at a moment of anger, <sighs> dysfunction, took out a sword and sliced the ear of Malchus off. You remember that? We talked about Gethsemane. And Gethsemane is a place of pressure where they would squeeze the olive. It was a place of sitting and waiting on the Lord, to sit and wait on Him. It's important. It was also a place of surrender. You remember the disciples. Jesus surrendered to the disciples and let them sleep. Jesus surrendered to deity, said, not my will but thine be done. Jesus surrendered to the, de to the deceiver, Judas, and told him, whatever you're going to do, do. And when he came up and kissed him, you know what happened? The ear, of course, of Malchus went to the ground. We're going to dovetail that today with a thought that I call, you don't have to stay stupid. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to stay stupid. <laughs> now, hey, 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 look here. Don't get carried away. You see, I was taught, you don't use that word. You don't say stupid. Well, if I don't use that word, then I have to use the sentence, which is showing a lack of common sense. That is the definition for stupid. Now, I could always say, look, turn to your neighbor and say, you show no lack of common sense. You see, I can say that to you, but it just sounds a whole lot better when I say, don't stay stupid. Because when you're in the South here, we all understand the word. Can I get an amen? I might upset folk up in the North, but down here, we understand what stupid is, stupid does. Hallelujah. So we want to make sure we understand as we walk through this, this moment again in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus told Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. You ever wonder when Jesus was praying how many times he was interrupted by Satan? 
How many times Satan himself, even though in, in the book of Luke tells us that he took him to the pinnacle and, 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 and encouraged him to jump, he encouraged him to turn bre- a, a rock into a bread. You know, in other words, there were times Satan, hello, visited Jesus and talked to him. And during one of those conversations, Satan said, you know, out of all 12 of your disciples, I already got one of them, but I'd like to have another one. He's one with a lot of influence. If you want to take out somebody, take out somebody with influence. So Satan said to Jesus, I would like to have Peter. I want him. Because if I could take Simon Peter and cause him to do the wrong thing, then I know that I can disrupt this whole thing you've got going. So Jesus made the statement that he asked you, he asked me of you that he may sift you as wheat. He wants to shake you up. He wants to stir things up in your life. You ever had anything stir up in your life? You ever got a phone call that disturbed you? You ever had somebody knock on your door that really shook you up? Mm. I have. If you haven't, I have. I've had it happen. And that shaking moment is here to define if you've got faith or not. Or enough faith to handle life. So he said, I prayed for you. Scripture says in the book of Hebrews, he, he's always making intercession for us. What? When, when, when the, the mamas of the house tell me, Pastor, I've been praying for you. That does something to me. But to know Jesus is praying for you. That he's pulling for you. That he wants you to win. He doesn't want your failure. He wants you to win. He said, I prayed for you that your faith not fail. And when you've turned back, your brothers are going to need help. You're going to need to strengthen them. And I think to myself, how many brothers and sisters do I know that I need to keep my faith that, that if, if, if I fail, it could affect them. And so I want to, you know, I've been down this road before, so I want my faith strong. Can I get an amen? amen. And I don't need to live stupid. <clears throat> I need to keep some common sense. Amen. Now smile at your neighbor and say, I didn't mean that. Father, thanks for the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 22, verse 49, Jesus said, When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Now, this is after they wake up in the garden. They woke woke up. So all all, all 11 that's there said, should we strike? You know, we all want to strike. But Peter is the presumptuous one. He's the one that can't help himself. He's going to go. There's a question there. Should we strike? Now, that, that after a question, wait for the answer. Everybody say, wait. wait. Wait for the answer. What did Simon Peter do? He didn't listen. He didn't wait. Amen. Immediately, the scripture, when they said, Lord, shall we strike? And verse 50, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear, and he healed him. Mm. Cut the ear off. There are such extremes when it comes to a lack of common sense. One of the problems I have with our education system is somehow there's a course called Common Sense 101 that's not being taught. So, a lot, and I don't mean it for all that are in school. I'm just saying that a lot have getting out overeducated and extremely dumb. And so here's Peter who takes the ear of Malchus and removes it from his head. When I look through the scriptures, we use the word fool. I remember, again, being told as a young man, don't ever call anybody a fool. You're in danger of hellfire. Somebody read a scripture and found out, you know, that, that, that you don't call fool. And then I realized that Jesus actually called people fools. And it, so if Jesus could call them a fool, Pastor Jerry can call them a fool. There were two fools in the Bible. There's the bullheaded fool and the pigheaded fool. Now, I'm not saying any of y'all are this, but I do have another church that's full of them. (laughs) There are two fools. The pig-headed fool is the sloth, lazy. The Scripture condemns laziness. Amen. God gave all of us energy. He gave us abilities. As a matter of fact, let me just say this to you. If there is a problem and you have the solution, you've created an opportunity for a business. I'm going to say it again. If there's a problem and you have the solution, you've created an opportunity 
for a business. My pastor told me today they had a hell storm in St. Louis. Beat them cars silly. Amen. Especially in foreign cars. They got big dents in them. He has a couple of them. And uh, he said, I, gotta get, I got a man coming over to fix it. He's going to fix the dings in the, in the car. Well, what happened there? A man cr- saw a problem. He created, he had a solution and an opportunity, and he created a business of taking dents out of vehicles. And all you got to do is live in a place with a lot of hell. <laughs> That's just fun to say. Amen. Okay, quit, Jerry. <laughs> so there's the pig-headed fool, lazy, stuck to the bed, eek, hitting the sno- When that snooze went off this morning, I looked outside, and it was still dark. I went, no way. Yeah. It can't be dark. Man, I mean, I just w- woke up, and it felt like I just went to sleep. You know, you sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold in the hands, and then poverty rushes in on you. So beware of that. Stay, don't, not busy, don't want you busy, but stay effective in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then there's the bullheaded fool, and I know you're not married to anybody like this, but the bullheaded fool is the stubborn. I mean, when you see pig head, you, you understand that that's, would be the pig, and we raised pigs when we were kids. Amen. We slopped, ho- they call it slapping the hog. The reason they call it that is whenever you put whatever food you got over in the trough, the hog comes and slops all over it. Now, I mean, they're, they're a mess. I mean, they're messy. They stink and stuff like that. That's why you got them way away from the house down by the neighbors. <laughs> Amen. And then, then the bullheaded well, you understand bulls, man, bulls. You're in Texas. You know about bulls. Some of you rode bulls. Some of, I ran I ran from a, a, one of them Brahma bulls when I was a kid. I had no idea them things were that fast. It looked slow to me, but man, he took off after me. I went under an electric fence. I didn't care if it was going to shock me. I'd rather take the shock than the hit. Hey, man, I, I'd heard about one guy that a Brahma bull got after him. He ran as fast as he could. He jumped for a limb, hey, man, and, and, and the bull missed him, but he got him on the way down. <laughs> they don't quit. They stay after you. But the bullheaded fool, stubborn, hot-headed. Do you know there are people that think that being stubborn is a spiritual gift? The Scripture calls them stiff-necked. Now, it doesn't just say stubborn. It uses the word stiff-necked, that your neck is just stiff. You, can't, you don't have the ability to flex when things are going on and work with it. You're, you're stiff-necked, stubborn. It's not a gift. It's a sin to be stubborn. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, stubbornness was connected to witchcraft. That if you were stubborn, you were like a witch. It's, it didn't say nothing about the men. <laughs> Just saying, okay? I'm just throwing that, just talking Bible here. (laughs) So here's Peter in a moment of foolishness. He had gone from one extreme to another extreme, on fire for God. And Jesus told him, Peter, this thing's going to happen to you. There's going to be some things that are going to happen. Amen. You know, I'm so appreciative that God can heal stupid. That he can take and just take that away, the, the, the bull-headed fool and the pig-headed fool. And it's no more of this, Jesus said. Amen. Extremes come from trying to correct something too fast. If you try to correct something too fast, again, uh, me, in a, in a snowstorm, as I'm driving, one of the things I did is I moved the wheel like this. Very, I, and I would even take my hands off the wheel and do this. Shake them because what happens is you grip too tight and and in a time of extreme, you'll go too quick and next thing you know, you find yourself in the ditch. So as you're moving through life, I speak to, I found out we have a lot of golfers in the church. Now, I had no idea until I started golfing again that some of y'all like hitting that ball. But I can tell you this, if you try to correct too quickly, you'll go from a slice to a duck hook. You get in trouble. You can't correct too fast. Amen. So extremes do that. And this is Simon Peter. His life was, whoo, I'm on fire. Whoo, I'm running away. That's what he would do. Amen. Back and forth. Amen. And so at this moment, Jesus touches the man's ear and he puts it back on him. Then season him, verse 54, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. The rest of the disciples have deserted. But Peter stayed and followed. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, which speaks of a cool night, and had sat down together, Peter sat with them. 
A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. Well, the strange thing about my life is over 40 years of preaching, 30 years of pastoring, I go places and I meet people that say, I know you. And it scares me. Because I wonder, where do you know me from? How do you know me? Amen. And then we get to chit-chatting and talking. I was on a train this week. And I'm sitting there and I look and I see two men. It was a miracle. I'm from Alabama. In Alabama, we have no pro football team. We just have two college teams that are major players. One is Alabama, the other is Auburn. There were two men sitting there, a little older than me, one with an Alabama hat on, another with an Auburn hat on. And they were sitting together. <laughs> and I pondered the miracle that I'm watching. Because these men should be enemies. They should hate one another. We were brought up to hate one another. If you wore orange and blue, I hate you. I'm crimson through and through. Amen. Bama, born, bred, who I am. Roll Tide. And I'm watching these two men, and I'm listening to them talk, Ed. And one of them said to the other one, I, I, I retired from TVA. TVA, that's where my daddy retired from. And the other one said, yeah, when I was up there in Surfield, Sur it ain't Surfield, it's Sheffield. But if you were in North Alabama, it's Surfield. It's got an R in it. I don't know why, but it does. My daddy always said that. And I'm listening to him, and I'm sitting there, and, I'm, and I mean, they, they brought me to you, H, and I'm listening, and I'm going, I can't take this no more. <laughs> and I went up, and I just sat down with them. They didn't know me from Adam. I sat down, and I looked at them. I said, y'all don't know me, but I, I think I know y'all. Y'all from North Alabama? I said, yeah. I said, I, I went to Carver Heights High School. My last name's Hovatter. All of a sudden, one of them beamed up and said, I know a bunch of Hovatters. And it got it excited right there. And it opened the door for me to share about Jesus. Amen. And began to talk to these two men and, and witness to them. And then I told them, I have never in my life seen an Auburn and an Alabama guy sitting together. And they said, well, it's all good right now. <laughs> Until the iron bowl takes place. And then all double -E double H-E double two picks are going to break loose. Amen. It's going to happen. So here I'm sitting there and I'm listening. Get, get away from that, Jerry. He denied that he knew. Look, I, I can't live in denial. He's done too much for me. Changed my life. He gave me heaven on earth. He blessed me. He said, you're one of them. And what I'm saying to you is this. I've told the band that if I put you up here, I'm going to make you famous. Don Nash, y'all remember Donnie? Saw Don yesterday. He's still famous. He's only with me nine years. Richard Golightly, still famous. All I got to do is get you on the stage, Josh. It won't be long. You'll be famous. Or infamous. <laughs> Peter was famous because he was running with Jesus. She knew him. She called him out. A little further, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also one of them. He said, man, I'm not, Peter replied. But an hour later, another asserted, asserted, certainly this fellow's with him. He asked the Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know who you're talking about. Now, let me just pause here just a minute. In another, trans, in another one of the Gospels, it says that Peter began to curse. If you want to hide your testimony, if you want to act like a non-believer, start cursing. Don't, don't worry about Sunday. Wait on Monday. When the words start flying out of your mouth. I've had situations. I got hit in the head with a skeet last week. You've never been hit in the head with a skeet? With one of them little orange birds? When you get hit in the head, what you going to say? That's right. All the men there looked at me and said, you, never, you didn't say a cuss word, Pastor. I said, no, I didn't even think of one. It hurt. I had a knot on my head. He meant knot head, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't standing close. It broke and snapped, and that's how it ended up. But what do you say when you're under that kind of pressure? Do you want to disguise yourself? I love I loved not cursing, 
But to be able to be with different men at different times and them not knowing that I'm a pastor and get an opportunity to share Jesus with them. Because sometimes when they know, they act different around you. That's why I stand at the door and talk to you. That's why I, I hang out with people. I know pastors that won't hang out with the people. They're afraid the people get too close to them and get to know them. I'm glad you know me. And I'm learning to know y'all. Uh, that other church. <laughs> Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus, as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. You got to see that moment. Jesus is being led away. Amen. He's, he, he's got his blood on his back from, from the bloody sweat in the garden. He, he's, he's understood the betrayal of, of Judas. Now the desertion of Peter and all the disciples. The rooster crows. He prophesied to him before you hear the rooster crow. Before morning time, you're going to hear the rooster crow and you'll deny me three times at that moment. And listen, Malchus is walking along with him with blood here, but his ear reattached. And as they're walking, Walking toward this place where the priest was, the rooster crows, Peter hears it, Jesus turns and looks at him. Hmm. Turn and look. Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. He just began to cry. That moment, bitterness could have entered into him. It could have changed him. Everything could have happened because of the weeping, the, the, the uh, extreme emotion. There are times that, that a look can change everything. I told my grandson, who's 12, I said, son, let me tell you something. I'm nice to you. I'm kind. I love kindness. I believe in it. But my daddy had a streak in him. He got saved late in life. I led him to Christ. But before all that, before he turned sweet, there was a streak in him, and he was a disciplinarian. And I was in the back of a 49 Ford truck, and my cousins, Tony and Bobby, dared me to get up. I was about eight years old or so, and walk to the tailgate and come back. It was a dare. I got to take the dare. They're my first cousins. You dare me? I'll show you how brave I am. I got up and I stumbled my way to the back of that truck and I touched the tailgate. When I turned around, amen, I looked up in the rearview mirror and there were the eyes of my father. Full of compassion <laughs> and understanding. Full of, I love you so much. That was good. Why don't you do it again, son? As soon as I saw his eyes, Mike, I fell to the ground and wept bitterly. <laughs> no, the, the weeping came later. <laughs> As my dad took me out behind the outhouse in the muscadine vines and said to me them words that I still will never believe. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I know he lied because he wore my butt out. <laughs> never stood up the back of a truck again. Amen. I'm 63 years old. I will not stand up in the back of a truck. I'll have somebody else jump up there for me. <laughs> Amen. Peter followed, the scripture said, at a distance. It literally means he drifted. He drifted. It's so easy to drift. If you know, he slipped. If you follow Jesus from a distance, you'll soon be warming yourself by the fires of the world. If you if just come into church on Sunday is all you got, you're in trouble. You got to live this thing through the week. Amen. You got to love God 24-7. You got to stay after Him. If you're, if you're warming yourself, the world will take you. The world will bring you back in. You can go back into it. So Peter, he sat with him. That was stupid. A little later, the Scripture says that he also sat with him. They said, you one of them. He said, no, I'm not. Ah, the rooster. The testimony of the rooster. To backslide means to deny by word or deed. To deny by word or deed. To act like you didn't even know him. About an hour later, somebody else asked him, amen. He said, I'm not a Galilean. Amen. And he began to speak in the rooster. Aren't we glad to know that Pete's life, though he made some terrible decisions, he got back on track? It doesn't happen with everyone. Some people just miss the grace. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I've used this scripture a lot. Out of the NIV, it says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile 
many. Roots, 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 roots are so important in life. There are certain trees that roots are so deep, like a palm tree, that it, no matter how much it shakes or pushes, even with the wind, it's going to stand. Then there are other things like oaks, oak trees whose roots are shallow. Your life, you have to decide how deep you want your roots. But the deeper your roots grow, the stronger you're going to be in the wind and the storm. Amen. And it blesses you. And at this moment, it talks about a root of bitterness. That inside of us, bitterness can grow. And it can happen to anyone at any time. You can slip into bitterness. I call it the slip, the grip, and the clip. The slip of bitterness is the secretive nature of bitterness. It slips in. It's looking for a crack. Amen. It's slowly over time. It can be undetected. You can get bitter about a lot of things. The problem, again, with bitterness is it doesn't stay with you. It affects others. I, have, I know a grown adults whose parents are dead and gone, and they're still bitter at their parents. And they've allowed it as their excuse to be not heads, to be wicked and mean, angry all the time, eat man, angry at their spouse. Let it go. They're dead and gone. You can't get a rebuttal from them. Amen. Go take a chair, sit by their tombstone, talk to the tombstone if you've got to. Tell them how you really feel. Then forgive it and walk away from it. And let the bitterness go. Can I get an amen? amen. See, what happens is bitterness not only slips in, but it'll grip you. The grip of bitterness is the paralyzing effect of it. Thereby many are being defiled. They're being contaminated. What, what we went through a couple of years ago, wearing a mask, getting shots, try not to contaminate people, try not to hurt You know, listen, guys, you are walking with the Dr. Jesus. He heals. He lo- delivers. He looks after us. I, I, I cannot live in a bubble. I refuse to. But when you're bitter, you affect people worse than any pandemic there ever was. You begin to uh, vomit that on other people, and you can't hush up about it and let it go. So it grips you. Amen. And then the clip, I looked up the word clip, literally means to hold in place. We put a clip. You girls, put clips in your hair. Some of you dudes have been trying that with your little man buns. Bless your heart. Amen. (laughs) But that little clip, that little clip you put on is to help hold in place. Bitterness will keep you in a place you don't want to be in. Bitterness, he wept bitter. Amen. There was something about that moment. We know that Judas betrayed Jesus out of bitterness. Amen. Because of hurt and anger, it took place. Whenever you will get into this place, what? how do you know you're there? First is a loss of humor. You can't laugh. Loss of joy. I had, a, I had a, somebody visit the church a while back, and, and, and somebody asked them, they said, or they asked me, they said, Pastor, what do people think about you preaching? I said, I don't know, let's ask the visitor. I looked at the visitor, I said, what do you think about this morning? She said, I love the preaching, and I felt like I came to a comedy show. <laughs> and I took no offense with that, because I want you to laugh. When you laugh, medicine goes down easy. Amen. A spoonful of sugar. You know what the Bible says? Oh, no, that's not, that's not the Bible. That was, that was Mary Poppins. Amen. <laughs> a spoonful of sugar helps some medicine go down. Some of that medicine you take, you say, well, that tastes good. But if you took it in its natural form, you'd, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last Sunday, I decided, because my pastor said about olive, olive oil, Olive oil. He meant the crushing of the olives, amen, and that it was a natural healing in the body. I started taking a swig of olive oil every day. Amen. Took a swig this morning. Uh, my daughter Katie put it in a Coke bottle for me so I could take it on the trip. I reached down every morning, pop the top, take a swig, screw it back up, pop it down. <sighs> Pure olive oil. No sugar. Just olive oil. How you feel, Pastor? Oh, don't know yet. <laughs> it's preventive maintenance. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I mean, I'd sell preventive maintenance all day long because you don't know if it's really helping or not. But I, I have to believe it's got to do something. Whenever bitterness gets you, you lost your humor. You lose your joy. You lose relationships. Oh, people, who wants to hang out with pucker face? Who wants to hang out with people who are always vomiting bitterness? I don't. I, I, I mean, so, some people say, I ain't got no friends. I don't know why I ain't got no friends. I know why you ain't got no friends. Because nobody wants to hang out with that mug of yours. If you could learn to smile, smiling is easy. Frowning takes work. 
It does. But smiling, smiling just, it's a natural response to loving Jesus. Amen. When, you, when you're full of bitterness, you lose your witness. Jesus, excuse me, Peter had an opportunity to witness to three people. Three. They were probably going to hell. But he let it pass by. And he denied who he was. He denied the moment. He forgot the miracle in the garden. The loss of witness opportunity. See, what happens when you fall into this place in life like Judas did, you can hit a place of no return. The Scripture tells us in Luke 16, verse 19, Jesus using a parable to talk about that which is to come. He said, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple, fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. Don't we envy those? Don't we envy those who are dress nice all the time, that live in nice big homes and drive nice big uh, vehicles and got life rolling and everything's good. It looks like no problem in their life. But he was rich. He's wealthy, man. He's way up there. And God's not against wealth. He's not against you having a home or, or anything else. It's your attitude while you got it. Come on. Amen. So the next slide says this. And at the gate was laid a beggar. His name was Lazarus. Now, don't get him confused with the Lazarus that was raised from the dead. This is a different Lazarus. This is in a parable. Jesus is just using a name. And he's covered with sores. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. If you've ever been so poor that you were at a restaurant and you saw some people left their food and you thought to yourself, I could get a little bit more off that steak. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't order that. I had to order the chicken, but, but I'd, I'd sure like to eat the rest of that dude's steak that left it. That's how this guy was. He wanted what was on the table, the rich man. Even the dogs got that. Amen. So the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. They both died. It's going to happen. You have to prepare for it. You got to be ready for it. Uh, it's going to take many of you by surprise like it has me when my sister died. When my dad died, I wasn't surprised. When my sister passed, it, it messed me. Messed with me. You, got, you need to know it's going to happen. One was poor. Doesn't tell us to stay poor. He's just using a, an example here. And one was wealthy. They died. The time came when they were carried. Next slide. In hell... Where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he's got a glimpse into paradise, into heaven. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus. Send the beggar who died of leprosy to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's in comfort here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm. There, there, I can't, there, there's, there's a place that we can't travel between. Amen. It's been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot they can't rescue out of hell, amen, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. Forget my tongue, forget the, the agony I'm in. Go to my father's house. I got five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. How many of you got family? How many of you got family? Wave at me. You got family? I remember when I got born again and reading this, all I thought about was my dad and mom and Jimmy and Sandy, my family. And God, who's going to reach my family? And God put that burden on me to do it. And I remember Acts 16, 31, it says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. And I took that verse and I wrapped it around myself and I quoted it to myself all the time. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. Acts 16, 31. I wouldn't let it go. It was a word buried down inside of me. And I remember when the opportunity came, it was when the biggest crisis in my life was going on, that my parents looked at me and said, you know, now we know you're human. It looked like you walked on water. Everything you touched turned to gold. But now we know you're human. 
And we'd like to know the same Jesus you know. Let me tell you, had I been bitter during the time of my, the biggest crisis in my life, my parents would have never asked of me, what's this Jesus is out of you? It's how you handle life how you bounce in life, how much you love him. I led my mom to the Lord. I led my brother to the Lord. I led my dad to the Lord. I baptized all four of my family members, including my nephew, who became a Jesus freak after that. Amen. So when I'm reading this, he said, I got five, bro. I got family. He said, let him warn them. Let, let Lazarus go to my house and warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Next slide. The next slide. He said to him, if they, oh, is that it? Okay. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They got Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. They got all the prophets. They know what happened with Jonah. Your brothers know what happened with Hosea. Amen. Your brothers know about all the line of prophets. They know about Amos and Malachi. Amen. They know about the prophets. Amen. They know about the first five books of the Bible. That's what Abraham's saying to him. He said that they, they know that. They know about the, and it, listen, if they won't listen to this, and they won't listen to the preacher, and they won't listen to the teacher, and they won't study the book for themselves, amen. So Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. And we got this idea that if somebody comes back from the dead, boom, we'll all repent. And, and listen, miracles only last for a moment. Many of you have had miracles in your life, and you still took a little moment to backslide, to drift a little. I, I'm talking about the next church. So he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. All right, we're stubborn. We're stubborn. Somebody comes up from the dead, they still won't believe. Who rose from the dead? Jesus. Did everybody believe? No. Not everybody believed. Even Thomas doubted. Even was the moment. i got to start closing this thing down, so I'm going to. In your lifetime, you received your stuff, not God's stuff. Amen. Good things. You did your thing with what God gave you. Amen. Look what you did with it. You were calloused to those around you. You were bitter to those around you. I love this quote from Leonard Ravenhill, who is the late Leonard Ravenhill. He said, could a mariner sit idle if he heard the drowning cry? Could a doctor sit in comfort and just let his patients die? Could a fireman sit idle and let men burn and give no hand? Could you sit at ease as a believer? Were the world around you damned? Hmm. A.W. Tozer, who another great preacher of old, said the stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present, and there must be no manifestation, or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. We need to wake up from our slumber. Quit pushing our snooze buttons and awaken to the call to be good messengers in a world gone bad. The worst mistake you can make is to hear my voice and turn and walk away and go into a devil's hell. I want to close with this thought. That ear... That ear, that ear, that ear. I couldn't get away from that ear. Tommy was his right ear. Amen. This ear, the right ear. He just removed the right ear, and the ear fell to the ground. You remember last week? <laughs> At that moment, Peter is either going to be imprisoned for the rest of his life, or they're going to kill him. They're going to take him out. Jesus bent down and took the ear and put it back on Malchus. He did not do it for Malchus. Malchus can live without an ear. Peter can't live without a neck. Why did he do it? I'm going to tell you why. To remove all evidence that there ever was a crime. To remove all evidence that anger struck out, to remove all evidence that at that moment, Peter could have, when you and I have struck 
and took ears off people. Last with our sharp tongues. Sinned, stumbled, missed the mark. And we said, Jesus, forgive us of our sins. Instead of like the rich man who just set up in a high place and didn't care about the poor and the beggar, he was stupid. No common sense. But when Jesus heals an ear, he removes all evidence that you ever were the culprit, that you ever were in danger of hellfire. He removes all evidence. Hey, how are you going to convict me? Are you going to convict me of taking Malchus's ear? Look at Malchus. His ear's been reattached. Oh, I know he's got a little blood, but he has no pain. He's got his ear again. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Think for a moment of how many times Jesus has healed somebody that you've hurt, that you lashed out at. And he didn't do it just for them. He did it for you. So you would understand that bitterness is not something for you to hold on to, but to release. How many times do the ears fall to the ground? Must he do that for us? God let kindness rule in our lives. There's roosters crowing this morning, reminding us of backslid ways, of drifting apart. You don't have the fire you had when you were born again. Slip your hand up right now. If you don't have the fire you had when you were born again, put your hand up right now. If you don't have the fire you had when you were born again, put your hand up right now. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, put the fire back. Remind me again of my love for you. Amen. Don't let it wax cold. Keep me on fire. Help me understand that if I don't reach them, hell will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.